It's the Dev Rant Podcast. Welcome to the Dev Rant Podcast. I'm David Fox, or as you might know me on Dev Rant, D Fox. And I'm Tim Rogus, aka T Rogus. We've got quite the show in store for you today. First, we're excited to share our talk with David Hannemeyer Hansen, commonly known as DHH, the creator of Ruby on Rails and Basecamp. Then we have a couple Dev Rant community members to share their popular rants and wrap up with some Dev Rant news and updates. Our chat with DHH is a fun one. We get into open source branding how to get a remote job, why meetings suck, and whether DHH would rather be a programmer or a race car driver. Awesome, David. Let's get to it. We're very excited to now welcome David Heinemeyer Hansen, frequently called DHH, as the featured guest on this episode of the DevRamp Podcast. For those not familiar, David is the creator of one of the most famous application frameworks ever, Ruby on Rails. He's also a founder and the CTO of the popular project management software company Basecamp. Aside from that, he's a best-selling author who co-wrote Rework, amongst other titles, and in his spare time, he also drives race cars. DHH, welcome to the DevRamp Podcast. All right. So to start things off, uh, let's go back to where it all began. When did you first get into programming? What was it that really got you excited about programming in computers? So I think the first uh, kind of any programming I did was typing in a uh, game from a magazine on my Amstrad uh, back in, yeah, whatever, the 80s when I was like uh, six, seven years old. But calling that programming is really a stretch since I just typed the characters that were in the back of the um, of the magazine. It's, it's funny to remember that that's how we used to distribute software was an actual paper. Um, and then over the years, I tried various ways to get into programming. I had a lot of programming friends. Um, but it really wasn't until the internet came around and the web came around that I got more serious about it and learned it fully. Um, So it took at least two, three, maybe even four tries before I really got programming. And it's funny because I still remember just getting hung up on some really basic concepts. Uh, I remember uh, back on the Amiga days, I was trying to learn EC Amos, which was this uh, programming language for game production. Um, And like, I was like, variables, like, why would you want to change them? (laughs) <laughs> and it's like it's just funny. It's like just this idea still stuck in my head of just some of the core concepts of conditionals and variables and so forth. It's just being hard to get. Um, so I kind of just didn't see myself becoming a programmer, and um, and then I got involved with the web in sort of the mid uh, mid to late nineties, um, and slowly just got like, all right, I got to learn HTML because I was doing these gaming websites and doing game reviews, and I got to figure that out. So I learned HTML. Oh, okay. Oh, so style it like this CSS thing or font tax or whatever. I'll figure that out. And then oh, we need to have like a, a content management system of some kind. Oh, my friend knows ASP. He shows me a little bit. Let me try to just change the things that he already made. And then slowly, just step by step, uh, getting into it. And then around the 2000s, I think, was when I then seriously committed. All right, let me just learn this PHP thing. Like, let me just learn it properly. because Then I can just do it myself. I don't have to ask my friends all the time about how to make things for me. It's just so much easier if I can be self-sufficient. And I learned PHP to to create something called DailyRush.dk, which is a, a Danish gaming site that's still running today. Some <laughs> that's awesome. 16, 17 years later, I think it's still nice. the biggest Danish gaming website. And until like last year, it ran on that original PHP code that I learned programming with in like 99, 2000. Wow. wow. So I thought like, that's actually pretty neat. Like one of the very first things I learned programming with was still active in operation like 15 16 years later that's awesome um but then it went pretty quick from there right like so i learned php and was like okay actually this is not perhaps as hard as i thought or perhaps it really was really hard because it took me i don't know 15 years to go from (laughs) to actually fully grokking the the basics and then um i just like okay i can do some more stuff with this i built a bunch of more php sites and then in 2003 uh, I'd been working with Thursday Signals for a couple of years, and we decided, hey, let's build our own product, this Basecamp thing. And now I feel like, oh, okay, I'm confident enough in this PHP. Let me try Ruby. And Ruby for me was really the light bulb moment where I went from like, oh, PHP is something I kind of know just because I need to build some websites. And then Ruby is like, holy shit, this is amazing. This is so much fun. Like I could totally imagine myself doing this for the rest of my life now. Um, 
like it was really just a, a revelation to come across a programming language that just went like boom. <laughs> Anyway, that's the short, short, uh, <laughs> the short yes. story. I, I love that HTML is the gateway drug to real programs. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We've all been that's down that I path. Really love the web. I love view source. View source <laughs> is probably one of the greatest gifts of people learning how to program. It certainly was for me. Just that I could look at a website, I could do view source, and then I could see what was going on. And I think that's unfortunately one of the things we kind of lost with ugly fires and yeah. fires and so forth. Like back in the day, you could just view source on any piece of JavaScript and you'd see what the hell was going on. That's a good point. Um, you can still do that with HTML and stuff. It's just, it's gotten harder and, and that's a little sad. I love being able to open the lid and look inside the box. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm really into open source uh, projects. I know some people who maintain uh, some pretty big ones. Uh, what were some of the biggest challenges in turning Ruby on Rails into such a successful open source and community driven initiative? Sure. So I think the first thing to get over with, which I really didn't have a lot of trouble with, but at the time, lots of people did, was to treat uh, an open source project like it was uh, uh, a branding slash consumer good. That it was something you had to sell, that marketing was not a dirty word, that you could put your best foot forward in terms of presentation and so forth, and, and that would help the project. I remember when I got started, there was, there was plenty of open source things around, and I'll, I picked up on a sense that lots of programmers working on these things thought that marketing was a dirty word. That like if you had a cool logo, or if you had a slick video, or a nice website, like that was actually not kosher right like yeah. you're not focusing on the hard things of computer science like it's supposed to be fucking ugly as website where the text just goes on and drones on right like just yeah give me the facts right and i think that with ruby on rails i just thought like no let's just sell this uh like any major entity that was trying to promote a new idea would sell it i looked at what microsoft and and Sun were doing with Java and, and whatever it was, Microsoft ASP was doing at the time. It was like, these guys have fucking booths at conferences. They have slick logos. They have marketing people. They have like, yeah. and I'm like, that's not that hard. We can do that too. And we can do it for like an one thousandth of the effort and we can make it count. So um, I think one of the early examples, banners of that was the, video I did. I did a 15 minute how to build a blog in Rails video back in 2003. And people weren't doing screencasts and so on at the time, really. And that really blew up, right? Like lots of people went like, oh, shit, like I can see it. I can feel it. I can taste it. And that matters. And then I also just did a lot of advocacy online and arguing with people before Twitter on mailing lists and uh, poking fun of Java folks and just <laughs> making a making a raucous space basically of like, hey, there's something new here. Like I just went from like, eh, programming is this thing I kind of have, have to do to build websites to holy shit, Ruby is a phenomenal intellectual endeavor and I absolutely freaking love it. And you should try it too, because if it is having this big of an impact of, on my life and my happiness, um, like why wouldn't you want to try it? It's fucking free. Right. Like yeah. there's not I'm not even trying to sell you anything in the traditional sense of selling because you're not paying me anything. I'm trying to sell you on an experience that blew my mind. Um, you'd be a fool not to give that a try. So I think that was that was getting over that hump of programmers feeling marketing is dirty and so on. And of course, these days, like you fucking can't launch a, a three line node package without having a slick website with a cool <laughs> name and a dot IO. Yep website and so forth right like so now we just take it for granted that um hey fucking even bugs now right like bugs have marketing departments that are <laughs> um, that are there with heart bleeds and and so forth yep. and i think that's good i think it's just basically recognizing that like humans to adopt new ideas like it just doesn't happen in an objective sense of the word there are so many good ideas in this world that never got anywhere because the people who had them or the people around them just couldn't communicate that uh, and isn't that a travesty, yeah. like, especially in the open source world when what we're doing is we're giving software away for free, literally. Right. Um, just put some effort into into making people see what what it is that you think you've got going on. Speaking of that, uh, in your book, Rework, you talk a lot about side projects, all those good ideas that are bubbling around. 
Um, uh, we're curious, what are some of your own side projects now or in the past you've worked on outside of Basecamp? Yeah, so Rails obviously is my number one side project. I got started with Rails when I was building Basecamp back in 2003, in extracted it from the code base, and then like for the next 13 years, I basically just turned every piece of programming side project that I worked on into some extension of that, right? Um, there's Rails itself, and I keep coming up with frameworks to jam into it. Um, Rails is, is sort of proudly a full stack framework, even though that idea sort of comes in and out of vogue. I think it's out of vogue somewhat right now. Like everyone is like, oh yeah, let's make every single one line of JavaScript into its own dependency tree that's <laughs> 500 uh, levels nested deep and blows up the internet if someone yanks the package. <laughs> um, so that's fun. I mean, and, and we have different ideas of sort of entertainment. That's not mine. Um, I like to make full stack frameworks. I like to make complete integrated systems and solutions. Right. Actually, I shouldn't use the word solutions. I fucking hate that word. Integrated <laughs> systems uh, is, a, is a good word I, I do like. Um, and Rails is absolutely an integrated system. I try to think of like all the problems I would hit when I, if I was going to build Basecamp again or GitHub or Shopify or any of these sort of larger, substantial web systems, what would be all the batteries I would want in my box? And like Rails should have all those. And if that's 1,500 batteries, good fucking 1500 batteries in the box like i'm not going to put in just two and then say hey go find the other 1498 yourself because i find that that's just such a folly we have a false sense of uh simplicity in this business which is like oh this one thing is really simple yeah but if you can't build big shit with that one thing then what does it help right like it's not simple if you're setting basically everyone out on a expedition tour to configure their own battleship like how is that simple oh i only made that one like little screw here and this screw is really simple yeah i mean it doesn't build your battleship right yeah i want to i want to ship you everything in the damn box with instructions on how to put it together and like then at the end you can go like oh shit i built a battleship that's awesome right so yeah. that's that that's what i think is simple it's not simple to to get there, and if you try to understand every level of the battleship on day one, yeah, that's not simple either. Um, but I think that that's the sort of little bit of the, the dilemma or, or the trouble we're, I don't know if trouble, um, the trade-offs we're dealing with is, on the one hand, we want to make it really easy to try Ruby on Rails. Make it really easy to get on board and like get that first success experience because that's what will keep your motivation up to actually learn the damn whole thing. But at the same time, I also don't have any illusion that like you can learn all of Ruby on Rails in the ecosystem in two weeks. You can't. No, sorry. Like learn how to build a battleship in two weeks, learn how to build a Shopify, a base camp or whatever in two weeks or two months or even six months doesn't happen yeah. and you have completely unrealistic expectations if you think that's going to happen and if anyone is telling you that they can teach you how to build these systems from scratch <laughs> in that amount of time they're just lying that's bullshit and, yeah. um so don't want that um i don't even remember the question now now i got on fucking tangent <laughs> <laughs> systems. um what were we talking about we we're talking about side projects oh side projects shit um <laughs> yes so a lot of side projects, too, it's not necessarily just Ruby on Rails, although that is a lot of it, right? Um, it's also other things around it, like Turbolinks, for example. So Turbolinks, to me, is is this reaction of, of looking and working with full st uh, or um, client-side MVC projects of various kinds and going, like, shoot me now. Um, and then thinking, like, there's got to be a simpler way where we can get the bulk of the effort, at least for the bulk of the work that I personally have to do. I mean... There's all sorts of different work that other people have to do. And if you need to do it with full client side MVC JavaScript up the wazoo, then God bless and best of luck. But I've been able to judo, as we like to call it at Basecamp, the problem in a lot of ways where the main thing I wanted was speed, right? Like I want a really fast web application. I want Basecamp to be turbo super duper fast. Um, one solution is to go with client side MVC. You can make some really fast apps that way. Uh, another solution was to go with Turbolinks. Um, so Turbolinks has really got me excited because it allowed me to sidestep a lot of that complexity that's going on in the uh, quote-unquote modern JavaScript world right now that I absolutely 
deplore the deplorables. Um, <laughs> and that's been a really fun side project. Um, funny thing is, like, I, I got to start it off. And then when we started working on Basecamp 3, um, Sam Stevenson and, and Javon McKinley at Basecamp took on and took over that project, basically, and, and created Turbolinks 5 which um, we created because we wanted to also go to native. We wanted to have native iOS and Android apps, and we wanted to do it from a single, glorious, magnificent monolith. Um, and uh, Turbolinks, in combination with Rails, was what got us there with a tiny team and, uh, and a huge product. Um, so that's one other side project. But I, pretty much any time I hit a piece of code where I go like, I don't want to write this again if I had to create Basecamp from scratch, I'm like, all right, let's start a new repo. Let's start a new project of some kind. Uh, let's spin it up. Sometimes, I mean, oftentimes it's just a pull request to Rails, but sometimes, like Turbolinks or, or other things, um, I spin up a new a new thing um, and and integrate it somewhat. Um, so that's my main side projects. I'm. Lots of people are like, oh, let me learn like a thousand different languages. Let me dabble in all sorts of different things and build toy things. That doesn't interest me so much. Uh, what interests me is making my daily life better, uh, my daily programmer life. And I still program all the time, nice. so, as much of the time as I can. Um, and what I program is, is Ruby and Rails to build Basecamp. So every, anything that makes that life better. Um, that's a side project sort of waiting to happen for me, and that's what I enjoy to do. Cool. Um, so one thing we like to do on DevRant is sort of pull uh, data and see what people are ranting about. So we found that one of the most ranted about topics is uh, product managers, and that's higher than bugs, documentation, bosses. Uh, so why do you think PMs get so much hate? Um, I think there's lots of lots of reasons for that, and, and perhaps the easiest is to uh, assume that making decisions about what we should work on is trivial, easy work, and a donkey could do that. So why someone that sort of can tell me what to do in, in charge of that? And I think that's an absolute misnomer. I think a lot of programmers are sorely deluded when they think uh, about how easy it is to balance all the things you could possibly work on. But a, a refrain I have, hey, let's just program, like let's just sit down and code. Um, and I mean, I totally get that. And, and I used to have perhaps more sympathy for that position until I just realized that like, I could program from now until the end of time. And if I did it on like things that didn't matter, I would be wasting my fucking life, right? Yeah. So figuring out doing work on things that actually matter, um, pretty important. Right. Again, that's not an excuse of programmers as a generality. I've worked with plenty of programmers underneath where I would sort of curse and whatever <laughs> at, at their existence just because they did stupid shit all the time that could be automated. Like, hey, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Is it done yet? Or like, hey, could you just also work on this other thing while you're working on this thing at the same time and preferably not miss any deadlines of any kind? Right. Yeah. There's lots of product managers that are completely delusional about uh, productivity and just core concepts of uninterrupted work and, and wasting time. And let's do another stand-up meeting where you all just one at a time tell me serially what you're working on so we can waste everyone's time for like an hour, right? Yeah. Retarded. <laughs> um, but, I mean, the, that, that's a sort of like, it's easy to throw the baby out with bath water there, that the core concept of figuring out what should we be working on in what order and and like how can we set this up in realistic ways i think is is valuable i've had to play that role many times myself um one of sort of the fondest moments i have of that actually was back in 2004 when i helped um alan work on textmate um the the text editor the first version of textmate that actually shipped was not the first version he actually built. It was like the seventh or the eighth version that he actually built. And I was like, dude, I cannot deal with these text editors on OS X. They're horrible. You, I've seen what you've done here. He was a friend of mine. I've been good friends with him for, for what, 10 years prior to that. And like, you have to, I need your software. Like, so I'm going to come in and I'm going to play project manager with you for like six months or whatever it was. It was long summer. And, and then some, and we're going to put out a, a text editor that I want to use. So let's get to that. And until 
like, what is it, like uh, maybe three months ago or something when I installed some OS upgrade that broke TextMate 1X. I use TextMate, that version of TextMate ever since. <laughs> <laughs> the version of TextMate that I helped uh, project manage back in 2004 lasted me 12 years. Wow. Um, and in that time, then I stepped away, right? Like I solved my own problem. Like, hey, now I have a TextMate that I like to use. And then um, I, I think that project could have done well with some project management post, post that, right? Um, so I think that was a good example of perhaps to some extent what happens when, when you have some project management and, and it then goes away and then you don't have some project management and, and you still have someone who's exceptionally talented, probably one of the best programmers I know, um, program all the time, but not end up with software that yeah. ships. And that's really what I ultimately care about. Like I enjoy just writing software for the hell of it, especially in Ruby, but I really care about shipping software. And to ship software, you have to do project management. Whether that is through a project manager or just some other way, but project management in the grand sense of the word has to happen. Yeah, uh, touching on that, a lot of people in their process of managing the development of software, uh, they do meetings. And I know you have strong yeah. feelings about meetings. Uh, particularly a uh, distaste. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, what is the, the worst meeting you can think of? You've ever been stuck in hell on earth. Yeah, for me, it's the number of participants. Like I, there's some magic border where like, if you could be four people on a meeting and you're like, oh, okay, you're five. I start like sitting and squirming in my chair and I see eight people on a meeting or 10 people. And I just go like, okay, just kill me now <laughs> because it is such an unproductive waste of fucking time especially if it's the kind of status meeting status meetings are really the worst status meetings of like let's just ask individually each person what are you working on and then go to the next one what are you working on what are you working on which basically just wastes everyone's time when you could just have written that shit up and i could have read it read it asynchronously right like we don't all have to sit on a meeting to do it but i don't know it, it's also just perhaps a a tick i have when i just see 10 people sit around and waste their time i just go fucking out of my mind because it just seems like such a damn waste um, to to do it. And yeah, I don't know if there's a, a particular meeting for me. It, it's the size and duration. Um, That's fair. Like you get two people, three people on something. It's not like you can't have a meeting and talk about things. For, to me, it's like use the meeting for actually debating ideas in an adversarial form. If we all agree on something, no need to have a meeting. If it's just an update on something, no need to have a meeting. Like meeting is used kind of like email, which is for everything, even though like email is a wonderful tool for like long form composed thoughts. It's a terrible tool for like pinging people as, as I am or, or a bunch of other things, right? Or for file management or even project management, like lots of people use email for. It's mm -hmm. wonderful for this one thing that it does really well. Meetings can, can be wonderful when you need like heated debate about a certain topic. It's fucking terrible for all sorts of other things. Amen. <laughs> so this is about your most recent book, uh, Remote, um, focusing on the nature of remote teams. So a large percentage of our user base is spread across the world, and many of them are interested in working remotely. Uh, so what's the top advice you'd, you'd sort of give someone looking to work remotely to make that happen? Yeah, find a company that's already on board with that. Um, it's funny after we published uh, remote, we actually, we had a job site at the time, uh, at 37 signals jobs, the 37 signals or whatever. There was just a general job site for developers and, and designers. And after that, we went like, screw that. Let's just make a site that's just for people who get and know how to work remotely. And we'll call it, we work remotely.com. So that's what we did. We created, a, we basically cap kneecapped our job site and said like, we will only take job ads from companies that work remotely. Um, Cause I found like, if you just like, oh, I'd like to work remotely. Let me just join this company and see if I can convince them to let me work remotely. Like chances are you're gonna have a bad time. Chances are like, if they give you the, the test of allowing you to work remotely, you're gonna be the only one and it's gonna be a miserable experience and you're gonna be left out and blah, 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 blah. Thankfully these days, there are tons of companies who do get it where you're not like mm -hmm. some renegade trying to turn the ship around. Um, they just, they get it because they found out all the benefits of remote working that we've learned, like best people from anywhere, no interruptions, no wasting your life on the commutes and blah, 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 right? All the things we went over in the book. Um, I think that's the way to go. 
if you want to work remotely, seek out companies that testify that that's what they get. Like, hey, we work remotely. So that'd be my advice. I mean, if you're a masochist, you can also just try to join some big company. You said, like, that's what we're going to do. And you're going to be the sole sort of hero trying to turn that around. Uh, can happen. Um, more likely, you're going to burn out and it's not going to happen. Cool. Uh, we had Andy Hunt in our last interview, and he talked about how companies are still struggling with Agile 20 years after the Pragmatic Programmer was published. Uh, given such great tools as Basecamp for task management, why, why do you think people are still having trouble following the Agile process? Well, I think there's multiple reasons. And, and one of them is that like Agile is a fussy thing, right? Like um, I think that it, it's, it's not as, it's a set of principles in its core form, like the Agile manifesto and so on, uh, people over processes and so forth. And at the same time, you have plenty of process-driven shit that's being sold through the Agile moniker. So I think it's, it's, some of it has just been, it's been watered down. Um, other thing is, I, I think there's just, it requires some intent. Like, let's just assume best intentions here, and let's just assume Agile as the uh, good thing, um, quote-unquote, that that people just have to get. I think it, it just works against human psychology to some extent that like, oh, you have to make decisions about what you need to work on and you have to prioritize that. And like, you have to chop up big problems into small problems. I think that right there gets a lot of people, right? It's much easier to say, hey, can you just build me a clone of this Facebook thing in three months? <laughs> Figure it out, right? Rather than actually chopping up a product or a problem into small bits, do those in iterations and so forth. Like that requires diligence and work. It's much easier to wave your hands and just say like, hey, just get it done, huh. right? And then you end up in, in waterfall or some variation of that as the, as the default. Because with those techniques, it's, it's easier to keep the uh, unknown as like a, a lure of potential. Yeah, we could be done in three months, like maybe. Like if you chop everything up into small problems that you can actually grab your hands around, it's very easy to go like, yeah, okay, no fucking way we're going to be done in three months. Like it's not going to happen um, because you measure velocity or whatever. Even if it's not in the technical sense of it, you just get a much better sense of are we making progress towards a big thing? If you're working on a huge honking project that hasn't been integrated and like people are just working in their own little things, it's much easier to be delusional for much longer. And being delusional is something that humans are uniquely attracted to, I think. Yeah. So we, we saw uh, you like race car driving. So if you could only do one for the rest of your life, which would you pick, programming or race car driving? Oh, programming any time of the day. I enjoy race car driving. It's a lot of fun. But nothing simulates the creative mind for me like programming does. It's just it's an infinite universe of fun and, like, I just yesterday I was working on two new smaller features for base and I just go like, this is just awesome. Right. I'm not trying to pretend that programming is always awesome. And sometimes it's certainly frustrating and so forth, but as an endeavor that you could say like, Oh yeah, I have fun spending 50 years of my life getting really good at that. I don't have anything else in my life that comes close to programming as a, as a pursuit. Um, so it's one of those things where, um, I like the um, I like the um, uh, Coco Chanel quote of uh, the best things in life are free. Uh, the next best things are very very expensive. I consider <laughs> race car driving a next best thing and programming a best thing. Like it doesn't in the in main in, in most cases it doesn't cost anything to to be a programmer, right? Like you need to have a, a computer of some kind, and then you can have endless amounts of fun with that. Right. And not even fun in like the ha ha entertainments and fulfillment, satisfaction, uh, pride in work, uh, all these core uh, motives for being a human, like and and looking at sort of having an, an impact and an evolution and a strive through their own programming in just that so accessible way where you just go like. I can learn all this stuff on my own. I did, right? So I learned programming on my own. I wasn't classically trained, so to speak. I didn't have a CS degree, although I did some CS courses. Um, that's fucking amazing, isn't it? Like that we can learn this domain and go with it for decades. Just 
hey, computer, internet, pick any flavor you want. Like the variety of yeah. uh, expression that we have in programming, it's just amazing. It's just, I f truly feel blessed about being alive at this age when this is what we get to do. Fuck yeah. Well, that looks like we uh, wrap it up for today with our time with uh, David Heinermeyer Hansen. DHH, a programmer, innovator, best-selling author, and race car driver. Uh, David, uh, thanks for being on the DevRent Podcast. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, man. He really gets into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a good interview. I loved how, you know, that, that moment of decision, race car driver versus programmer, there was no thought. He was just like programmer. <laughs> just yeah. so much passion there. I, I, I thought it was pretty cool how he still works on features for Basecamp. I, I wouldn't have suspected that. Yeah, after all these years, you know, Rails and Basecamp, man, it seems like that's where his heart's at. I think yeah, there's some really good advice on the getting remote jobs as well, like to go yeah. after the the low hanging fruit of people that are already doing it versus trying to convince them and sell them over. That was a really good advice for our, our community. Yeah, yeah, because we, we do get a lot of rants, I think, of people, you know, looking to acquire that kind of work or go into that field. So I, I think that should be good. No, just a great talk. Really, uh, really enjoyed having him on the on the show. Yeah, definitely. It was awesome. Coming up next, we have a couple of community members talking about their popular rants. Uh, let's just uh, get right into it. Right now, we have a popular ranter on the line, Andy, whose username is Peem, and his top rant has over 600 plus pluses and has captivated the DevRant community. Hey, Andy, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Uh, Andy, to get things started, we're going to do a dramatic reading of your rant. So uh, let's hear from you. Okay. A young guy I work with burst into tears today. I had no idea what had happened, so I tried to comfort him and ask him what was wrong. It appears his main client had gone nuts with him. They wanted him to make an internet toolbar, thinkask.com, and he politely informed them that toolbars don't really exist anymore, and it wouldn't work on anything like modern browsers and mobile devices. Being given a polite but honest opinion was obviously something the client wasn't used to. Knowing our guy was young and fairly inexperienced, they started throwing very personal insults and asking him what exactly he knew he knew about these things, a lot more than them. So being the big, bold, handsome senior developer I am, I immediately phoned the client back and told them to come and speak to me face to face and apologize to our guy in person, or we'd terminate their contract with immediate effect. They're coming down tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, this this is an intense one. I think it really, uh, I mean, crazy outpouring of support in the comments on this rant uh, as your situation evolved. Uh, tell us what happened next, Andy. So next, we um, we scheduled a meeting for the day after at 12 o'clock for the, um, the client to come down and speak to Tom, the guy in the rant, and myself about what happened. We were waiting for them the next day, and I was sat there in the office, and it got to 12 o'clock, and nobody turned up. And it got to about quarter past 12, nobody turned up, it got to about half past 12. And I was thinking, okay, this guy really needs to show up now. This guy really <laughs> needs to get here. So I go down to the reception and I'm expecting to see the guy on the phone who had spoken to Tom yesterday. And the receptionist shows me this lady. And I think that's a bit strange because the lady shouldn't be there. What I'm expecting to see is a very scary man. And as I'm as I go up to the lady, I say, hi, are you here to see us? And she, it turns out she is. And I'm, I think, well, who, is, who is this lady? What's she got to do with the client? What's she got to do with the client company? And it turns out this lady is actually the CEO of the client company. And I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked. I didn't, I, I mean, we've never spoken to the CEO. We never had anything to do with her. She's kind of a lot higher above than the people we deal with. So she asks if we can go into an office and if we can speak. And she asks if Tom can be there. And originally, I wanted to keep Tom away from all this at the beginning. He was he was really nervous the night before. He was really worked up. He was very upset about what had happened and how people had spoken to him and how he'd been treated overnight. The, the next day, he didn't want to come into work. The next day, he started to write his resignation letter wow. and he wanted to just get out of there. On the morning of the meeting, he was just saying to me, "We don't. I don't want to be here. I didn't want Tom to have to see or speak to anybody until I calmed the client down. And I was thinking, this this lady isn't the client, so maybe it's going to be okay. And as we went into the office, the CEO came in with two boxes, a big box and a little box in a bag. And I thought, that's, that's a bit weird. And what she'd done, then the reason she was late to the meeting, was she'd stopped off on the way, coming halfway down the country, to buy Tom a MacBook Pro and an iPhone. And that was, that was amazing, because I was thinking, that's that's... That's really cool. There's yeah. no, there was no need for her to do that. It was just brilliant. And we were thinking, 
what is, what is it? Is, is it an old? And it turns out it was a brand new iPhone <laughs> 7 and it was a brand new MacBook Pro. Wow. And we were, we were thinking, well, can, can the rest of us be told off? What's going on? Here? <laughs> it was it was really fun. But what had happened was between the afternoon where Tom had spoken to the, the man from the client company and the next day where the client where the CEO of the client company had turned up at our offices, the, the man from the client company had been overheard speaking to Tom by one of his own co-workers and he's been reported to the CEO of the client company and not just upwards but directly to the CEO and this this man was already on his final warning and it turned out he'd been sacked overnight he'd just been let go he was already on his final warning and he was already been warned about other things and he'd already done this kind of thing spoken to people like this and what the CEO had said was she'd known about it for a long time and she wanted to carry on working with Tom and carry on working with our company with a better replacement. And it was just brilliant because Tom now had a better person to work with with the client company. They had a great relationship with the client company now. And the client company, the CEO of the client company, had bought some brand <laughs> new equipment, especially for Tom. And it was just it was just amazing. It's a pretty happy ending, Uh and yeah. had the, the, had the bad guy got fired yeah. and uh, and Tom got some great equipment and now a better person to work with. It's great to know that things can, can work out even when they seem so miserable sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, 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 I want to ask you, and this is, you know, this is just a, a question. Um, were you surprised at all by the, by the responses you got? And, and why do you think that this, like so many people were able to relate to this? I, I was amazed when I first posted it. I actually put, I posted it on the night of the day it happened, and I drove home. And there was a traffic jam, a two-hour traffic jam, and I'd been waiting a long time in the traffic jam. And I got home, and I thought, I'm really furious about this. There's no one in the house. What can I do? So I posted it on Devran because I had nobody else to tell. And I thought, I'm just going to write this really quickly. And I wrote it, and I had a lot of spelling mistakes, and I had a lot of mistakes, and I didn't care. I just wrote it. And it was really long and really kind of just exactly how i was feeling and i just posted it and i sent it and i went inside the house and i made myself something to eat and about 40 45 minutes later i thought there's there's no way i should have written i should have written that it's nobody's going to care it's too long it's there's too many spelling mistakes it's not very interesting <laughs> and I, I thought right i'll open up the app i'll see what's going on and i just delete i just delete the rant there's no need for it to be there and i had about 50 50 likes 50 <laughs> pluses and it was brilliant i'd never i'd seen that before but only in kind of a span of 24 48 hours and this had happened in about 30 40 minutes wow it was just amazing how many people had just liked it straight away yeah i mean we were we were surprised too i think it was one of our fastest like plus plus one rants uh, ever I, I don't think we've ever seen one get that many votes that quickly but, but it was awesome yeah, it was, and I mean, what is amazing is it just keeps coming. So my phone gets about 10 every few hours, and it, <laughs> people just seem to really connect with it. I don't know what it is, and the comments on there are brilliant. I keep reading the comments, and I keep checking the comments, and some of them just, some of them are just hilarious, and it's just amazing. And I think the reason it really works is because the rants, nothing specifically to do with any kind of work. It's just mm. how people are treated in the workplace. And it's just really interesting to see loads of people. So many people have the same. Um, so many people have the same problems. So many people have the same issues yeah. with how people coworkers are and how clients are. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Okay, so we, we, we just like to do a little speed round with uh, with each guest. Um, so so we'll go through this. So we're just going to ask you a few quick prompts, and you could just do one one word answer is uh, is fine. Starting off, favorite programming language. Uh, PHP. Favorite IDE? Uh, the only IDE I use would be uh, Android Studio. Cool. Mac, Windows, or Linux? Um, Windows normally a bit of Mac. Spaces or tabs? Uh, spaces. Emacs or Vim? Um, fuck them both. Fuck them both. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then for the final question, if you could be doing anything in the future, your dream job, what would it be? Um, oh, I'd really like, I'd really like to do something where you can, where I just work in a big team of just inventions and ideas and someone can come in. I'm not sure if there's a, a name for it or a, a name of the job, but just something where someone can come in one day and say, Hey, I've had this idea. Can we just test it out? And we just 
build new ideas and just put things together, some kind of experiment or kind of lab or something like that. Awesome. Well, Andy, I think that wraps it up for us. So uh, thanks so much for sharing your story about uh, you and Tom. And, and it's, yeah. it's awesome that things worked out. Not everyone has a happy ending. But uh, yeah, thanks again for being on the DevRant Podcast. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. We have our next renter with us, SwitchStep. Uh, so hi, SwitchStep. Welcome to the show. Hi, Deep Fox. Hi, T. Rogus. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. We're going to start by doing a dramatic reading of your rant. You wrote this one in response to Week 18 Group Rant Prompt, Family's Reaction to Becoming a Dev. Switch step, let's hear it from you. Okay. My grandma saw me programming for one whole day, and she started to rant, Grandma. She's been sitting all day in front of her computer doing computer stuff. Electricity bills getting higher. Mom, well at least she's not out late at night getting drunk and partying, Grandma. Computer girl. So, yeah. <laughs> that was great. That's so awesome. So, I'm picturing a, a sweet old uh, lady muttering computer girl under her breath. It's, it's so classic. Yeah. So, uh, besides, <laughs> besides using up electricity, what does your grandmother think computers are for? For games. <laughs> mm. But there... now she knows that it's for work because most of her grandchildren are working and most of us are in the IT field. Mm. So... She got used to it, like everybody sitting and then doing computer stuff. That, that's cool. Have you have you tried to get her involved with computers at all? No, she's really afraid. Um, you know, she's really cute. She has this smartphone, but her but her contacts she lists them down in her actual phone book. She's <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, you can't can't trust computers. You gotta you gotta write that down. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> Back up all my Dropbox in paper is very important. Yeah. <laughs> what did she wish you would do with your career? What did What did she have in mind? Hmm. Arts and crafts, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's good at it. She's really good at it. That's cool. Crafty grandmothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to do a little speed round. Um, we're we're going to both ask a few prompts, and you could just answer, you know, with, with very short answers. The first one is. Your favorite programming language? PHP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite IDE? Atom. Mm. Yes. Mac, Windows, or Linux? Linux. Spaces or tabs? Tabs. Definitely oh. tabs. <laughs> <Burn>. <laughs> Emacs, Vim, or fuck them both? Well, fuck them both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is one final question. Uh, if you could yes. be doing anything uh, in in the future, your dream job, what would that be? Um, dream job is to be a teacher, teach kids how to program. That's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Switch up. Thank you for being on the show, uh, Dev Rant. I think that about wraps it up for us. Happy thank ranting. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Bye. Well, wow, that was great having those uh, those two on the show. Uh, some really interesting stories. Let's uh, give some updates on DevRant, what's coming up in the future. David, what do we have lined up? So November 16th, we're going to be at the Momentum Conference in, uh, in Brooklyn. And if anyone listening is attending, uh, definitely make sure you come by and, and chat with us. You know, we want to talk to everyone. Um, we're hoping some, you know, DevRanters will be there. Yeah, free swag, guys. <laughs> um. Aside from that, we have a really cool new feature uh, where we're really excited about that should be coming within a few days. Uh, it's called Stories, and what it does is it makes it easier to browse long-form rants, uh, you know, when you want some funny or juicy stories to, to read, um, which, which we think should be pretty cool. Yeah, it's a uh, you know, slightly different format to, to the main feed and uh, offers a, a very easy way to, to get at uh, some of the really unique content that doesn't exist anywhere else. So hopefully you guys will like it. As far as the the podcast, you know, we've uh, this is episode two, and you know we're taking it and uh, you know continuing the future. So if you guys have any feedback, we'd love to hear what you think about the show, any topics we kind of got into, or anything you feel like is missing that we should do better, <laughs> uh, and certainly any guests that you think we should have and, and try and get on the show, uh, let us know. Uh, you know, just reach out uh, info at uh, devrant.io or uh, hit us up on the app. D Fox or T Rogus.
So that's all we've got today for this episode of the Devran Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm T. Rogus, a.k.a. Tim Rogus. And I'm D. Fox, also known as David Fox. <laughs> Happy ranting. <laughs> <laughs>